Hi, I'm Morgan. We're in the Jackrabbit Hollow. Today we're going to do a soft cheese. It's a lot like a 30 minute mozzarella without the stretching process. Alright, to make this cheese you're going to need a slotted spoon, citric acid, measuring spoons, a measuring cup, either rennet tablets or liquid vegetable rennet, a big pot, and one gallon of milk. Step one, pour one gallon of milk into the pot. The fresher the better, local is better. But today, we're using donated milk, which is the best because it uses something that would otherwise be thrown away. We want milk that's been pasteurized under 172 degrees Fahrenheit. Next, add one and a half teaspoons of citric acid to one cup of cool, chlorine-free, fluoride-free water. Stir it up until it's all dissolved. Turn your pot on to medium and add your citric acid solution through the slotted spoon while it's warming. Now stir it vigorously in. Another important thing that you will need is a thermometer. Heat the milk and citric acid to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. When our milk reaches 88 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, we're going to add the rennet. Here's two kinds of rennets that were available in my town. I recommend the Cheese Queen's liquid vegetable rennet this is what they sell at my local health food store. This is what they sell at City Market. These don't work so well, and the recipes need adjustment, but they can still get the job done. That's why we're gonna use this today. Okay, when you reach temperature, turn off your heat and remove your pot. Okay, now I'm gonna add one quarter teaspoon of my liquid rennet, which is equivalent to one quarter tablet to one quarter cup of water. Convenient measuring systems. Now pour it in through the slotted spoon and stir it, but this time slowly. Now cover it and let it sit for five minutes. While that's going down, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of cheese. Mozzarella is a fresh cheese, originally from Southern Italy, traditionally made from Italian buffalo and later cow's milk by the pasta filata method. The term is used for several kinds of Italian cheeses that are made using spinning and then cutting. Hence the name, as the Italian verb mazzara means, to cut. Fresh mozzarella is generally white, but may vary seasonally to slightly yellow depending on the animal's diet. It is a semi-soft cheese. Due to its high moisture content, it is traditionally served the day after it is made, but can be kept in brine for up to a week, or longer when sold in vacuum sealed packages. Low moisture mozzarella can be kept refrigerated for up to a month, though some shredded low moisture mozzarella is sold with a shelf life of up to six months. Mozzarella of several kinds is also used for most types of pizza and several pasta dishes, or served with sliced tomatoes and basil in insalata caprese. Mozzarella di bufala is traditionally produced solely from the milk of the domestic buffalo. A whey starter is added from the previous batch that contains thermophilic bacteria, and the milk is left to ripen so the bacteria can multiply. Then, rennet is added to coagulate the milk. After coagulation, the curd is cut into large one to two inch pieces and left to sit so the curds firm up in a process known as healing. The curd mass is left until the pH is around 5.2 to 5.5, which is the point when the cheese can be stretched. The cheese is then stretched and kneaded to produce a delicate consistency. This process is generally known as pasta filata. The history of cheese predates recorded history. The origin of cheese is assumed to lie in the practice of transporting milk in bladders made of ruminants' stomachs, with their inherent supply of rennet. There is no conclusive evidence indicating where cheese making originated, either in Europe, Central Asia, the Middle East, or the Sahara. Cheese making had spread within Europe at the earliest level of Hellenic myth, and, according to Pliny the Elder, had become a sophisticated enterprise by the time ancient Rome came into being, when valued foreign cheeses were transported to Rome to satisfy elite's tastes. Shards of pottery pierced with holes found in pile dwellings of the Urnfield culture on Lake Neuchatel, dated about 6000 BCE, are hypothesized to be cheese strainers. The earliest secure evidence of cheese making dates back to 5500 BCE in Kujawe, Poland. Dairying seemingly existed around 4000 BC in the grasslands of the Sahara. The cheese, as the only form in which milk can be kept in a hot climate, is likely to have accompanied dairying from the outset. It is probable that the process of cheese making was discovered accidentally by storing milk in a container made from the stomach of a ruminant, resulting in the milk being turned into curd and whey by the rennet remaining in the stomach. Though the Arab legend attributes the discovery of cheese to an Arab trader who used this method of storing milk, cheese was already well known among the Sumerians. 
The evidence for cheese are the Sumerian cuneiform texts of 3rd dynasty of Ur, dated at the early 2nd millennium BCE. Visual evidence of Egyptian cheesemaking has been found in Egyptian tomb murals, dating about 2000 BC. The earliest cheeses were likely to have been quite sour and salty, similar in texture either to rustic cottage cheese or to present-day feta. In the late Bronze Age, Minoan Mycenaean Crete, Linear B tablets record the inventorying of cheese, as well as flocks and shepherds. Cheese produced in Europe, where climates are cooler than the Middle East, required less salt for preservation. With less salt and acidity, the cheese became a suitable environment for useful microbes and molds, giving aged cheeses their pronounced and interesting flavors. Ancient Greek mythology credited Aristias with the discovery of cheese. Homer's Odyssey describes the Cyclops making and storing sheep's and goat's milk cheese. We soon reached his cave, but he was out shepherding, so we went inside and took stock of all that we could see. His cheese racks were loaded with cheeses, and he had more lambs and kids than pens could hold. When he had so done, he sat down and milked his ewes and goats, all in due course, and then let each of them have her own young. He curdled half the milk and set it aside in wicker strainers. A letter of Epicurus to his patron requests a wheel of hard cheese, so that he may make a feast whenever he wishes. Pliny recorded the tradition at Rome that Zoroaster had lived on cheese. By Roman times, cheese was an everyday food and cheese making a mature art. Okay, it's been five minutes. Now we're going to cut the curd like a nice checkerboard. Now we're going to put it back on the stove and heat it to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Now what we're going to do is start stirring it slowly and compressing the curds together. Try not to break them up too much. Now what we're going to do is heat it. We're going to bring it to 185 degrees when it becomes really stretchable, which is what makes it mozzarella. Some people do this by heating it repeatedly in a microwave. I didn't like that method, and I think microwaves are So what I do instead is I just keep heating this way. So if you want to save the whey, say for making ricotta, you can heat up a pot of water instead. All you'd have to do is scoop up the curds, compress them into a ball, and dip them in the water. Because we're going to compress the curds slowly as it heats. While we're waiting, as Romanized populations encountered unfamiliar newly settled neighbors, bringing their own cheese making traditions, their own flocks, and their own unrelated words for cheese, cheeses in Europe diversified further, with various locales developing their own distinctive traditions and products. As long distance trade collapsed, only travelers would encounter unfamiliar cheeses. Charlemagne's first encounter with a white cheese that had an edible rind forms one of the constructed anecdotes of Notker's Life of the Emperor. Cheese making in manor and monastery intensified local characteristics imparted by local bacterial flora. The identification of monks with cheese is perpetuated in modern marketing labels. Today, the British Cheese Board claims that Britain has approximately 700 distinct local cheeses. France and Italy have perhaps 400 each. A French proverb holds there is a different French cheese for every day of the year. And the Charles de Gaulle once asked, how can you govern a country in which there are 246 kinds of cheese? In 1546, the proverbs of John Haywood claimed, the moon is made of green cheese. Green may refer here not to the color, as many now think, but to being new or unaged. Variations on this sentiment were long repeated, and NASA exploited this myth for an April Fool's Day spoof announcement in 2006. Still, the advancement of the cheese art in Europe was slow during the centuries after Rome's fall. For cheese, though it became a staple of long-distance commerce, was disregarded as peasant fare, inappropriate on a noble table and even injurious to gentle health through much of the Middle Ages. Langlands, Piers Plowman, and his fellow peasants faced the allegorical figure of hunger saying, all I've got is a couple of fresh cheeses, a little curds and cream, an oat cake and two loaves of beans and bran which I baked for my children. Now this part you can use a big spoon, but if you're like me, you want to use your hands. So make sure to wash your hands or use gloves. I'm actually going to start molding the curds into a ball very slowly. Now with a slotted spoon, take out your curds and put them in a strainer. Now I'm going to put the curds in a bowl and drain off any excess water. Slowly dip your curd into the hot water. After we've cut our curds, we can bring it to 130 and stir. Then using a cheesecloth, handkerchief, or pantyhose, drain the whey from the curd and squeeze it gently. 
Now you're going to put it in a hanging position and let it drip dry. All right. While we're waiting for that cheese to drip, we can prepare our herbs and spices. I'm gonna have a lemon juice, garlic, and dill. Mm -hmm. Now all you got to do is mix your cheese and your spices together. Now whatever you're seasoning it with, you want to add a little bit of salt. I recommend natural sea salt. Until its modern spread along with European culture, cheese was nearly unheard of in Oriental cultures, in the pre-Columbian Americas, and only had limited use in sub-Mediterranean Africa, mainly being widespread and popular only in Europe and areas influenced strongly by its cultures. But with its spread, first the European imperialism and later of Euro-American culture and food, cheese has gradually become known as increasingly popular worldwide. The first factory for the industrial production of cheese opened in Switzerland in 1815. But it was in the United States where large-scale production first found real success. The 1860s saw the beginnings of mass-produced rennet, and by the turn of the century, scientists were producing pure microbial cultures. Ceramic cheese dishes, or cheese wizards, became one of the most common ways to prolong the life of cheese in the home, and remain the most popular in most households until the introduction of the home refrigerator in 1913. Now we do a taste test. Maybe a little more lemon juice. Factory-made cheese overtook traditional cheese making in the World War II era, and factories have been the source of most cheese in America and Europe ever since. Today, Americans buy more processed cheese than the real factory-made or not. But I think we can change all that. We can make cheese together with friends and family. Making cheese is truly an empowering experience. And I hope this inspires you to get out there and try making some cheese of your own. See what you come up with. Ask someone to join you. Who knows? You might just have some wonderful experiences. This has been an episode of Making Soft Mozzarella Cheese. We're in the Jack Rabbit Hollow. See you next time. Now that's good cheese. I'm mean as a